talk and presentation. Thank you very much for coming, especially two of you. Hello. <laughs> so our next presentation. Uh, so I'm always looking at my app because there's so much program. <laughs> I want to welcome Eva Maria Ochebauer, and she's going to talk about Nigerian analog photography. Welcome, thank you very much for coming, and uh, thank you for the talk. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thanks Dino for inviting me to give a talk on Nigerian analog photography. I wait a little bit till everybody who wants to listen has a seat. And firstly, I want to uh, briefly introduce myself in terms of Nigerian photography. In 2012, it was the first time that I came to Lagos with an exchange program, and so it's about 10 years, and then later I did the Lagos Photo Summer School, which is a teaching program for Nigerian photographers, and then later in 2016, collaboratively with Silvestro Gwonedi Okbeshi, a Nigerian art historian, I founded the photofactory.lagos, which is also hosting this talk. And we do workshops and publications and talks like this and exhibitions. And now I want to start with my talk. Dino, can you please put the first image? Yeah. The first Nigerian photographer was Jonathan Adagogo Green, who was born in 18... 87, and he was the first Nigerian professional photographer who comes from the Abani people, coming from an affluent trading family, so they were already in touch with the British. And he t was taught photography in Sierra Leone, and then worked for the British and both for the Abani people. And here you can already see a respectful image of an African person. Can we go to the next, please, Dino? And here, you know, you can see on, I think from your side, it's the right image, also from Adagogo Green, where we see a person portrait, like it's a, we can see actually a human being relating to the photographer, even he looks a little bit sad, I think due to the times there for the African people, but still it's a big difference to the image we see to the other side, which was photographed from a British anthropologist, we see under terms of categorizing people in race, strange human construction, and we can definitely see that the people do not really feel comfortable to be photographed like this. Next, please. And this is also from Adagogo, very famous picture, like here we see the Oba on of Ramen, the Oba of Benin, who was captured by the British, and this is uh, on the ship where he was brought to exile where he stayed the rest of his life. And meanwhile, this is a very famous picture, actually. Then we, it's from an American publisher. There is a book on Jonathan Green. So actually, he is highly established in the meantime. And he died at the age of 32. We don't know how, very mysterious. So obviously, I think for him, it must be really difficult to at one time work with the British and the other and work with his own people. Can we go to the next photographer, please? Yes, I mean, I go in generations. Like the next photographer is Chide Ochekare, who was born in the rural areas and then went to Ibadan. And there he was an apprentice in a studio photography workshop. And in 1960, in the year of independence, he went to Lagos and worked for TV, and in 1967, he was part of the Nigerian artistic uh, community. So actually, he concerned himself as an artist, and in 1980, no, 1968, can we have the next? He started on these hairstyle photographs, where we can see he had really a highly conceptual work, all the photographs from the back. Next, please. So, and he has a huge number of these photographs. And we can really see the conceptual approach to this work. 
and also showing, you know, the high cultural heritage about the hairstyles, like, you know, for the community there, it really means something. There are hidden Medici messages within the images, like we see whether a woman is married or not, or which social status she has, and lots of communication transports through the hairstyles. And here we see when I met him in 2012, we were lucky to visit him, and I was wondering, because he all has these analog negatives, and we know, I mean, there is like tropical climate, the humidity, but he kept them all in wooden boxes, everyone in an envelope. Next image, please. And here, you know, like he has, uh, on every negative he has written about the image, and they were totally preserved, and this was in 2012, so actually he really managed to, to keep his negatives really well. In the next image, here we see him where he was 80 years old, and in 2014 he died, two years later. But a wonderful man, like it, I was, we were really happy to be able to meet him. And also, meanwhile, you know, he is highly, everybody knows about him, so actually, he is highly acclaimed. Next generation is Akimbodi Akimbi. He was born in 1946 in Oxford, where both of his parents were studying. So actually, he is this generation who was really between the Western world, like born in England, and the Nigerian world. And then when he was four, he went back with his parents to Lagos, then he went to school in Lagos, then he went to secondary boarding school in England, then he came back to Lagos to study. So he is really torn in between these two worlds in a way, and then he went to Heidelberg, where he studied literature and started to photograph. Always six by six, till today, he's always with his roller flex. You do not see him without his back. And also, next image, we can see he uses a lot of writing within his images. Can we see the next, please? And also, Akimbodi, as he lives in these two worlds, he really worked very much as a mentor for young African photographers, but also you know, as a guy who was gaping the bridge and bringing lots of uh, photographers to Europe and writes a lot about it and is actually a very important figure within the field of African photography. Can we see the next, please? Another image. And he works mainly in big cities. The next one, please. And here we can see how he presented his images at the Documenta 14. It, I mean, in a small photography world, he was well known, but for the broader audience, not really. But he showed a document of 14, and here also we can see how he put his six by six images in a block, which of course gives the work like, like space, like power. And when he was shown this at the document of 14, all of a sudden he got really famous. Meanwhile, everybody wants something from him, which is of course good for him, but it took really quite a while till he got discovered, but now next, next year he will show at MoMA and like he's really very well known now, we're very happy about. Next person is Romy, uh, Rotimi Fani Kayode. He was born in 1955 in Lagos from an affluent Yoruba family. His father was an important politician, but the family, when he was 12 years old, moved to London because of the Civil War, the Biafran War. And then he grew up in London. He studied in Pratt Institute in New York photography and came back in the 80s and made most of his work. Can we go through, please? Most of his work he made between 82 and he died 89 on AIDS. And he works a lot about identity, about sexuality, about spirituality, like all his images are inspired by the Yoruba religion. Or let's say by the Yoruba spirituality maybe fits better for this. And also one thing, I mean, everybody knows him about Rotimi Fani Kayode, but actually he worked together with his partner, Alex Hurst, a British guy who photographed him. So I think, you know, even most of the things came from him. Can we, yeah, okay, came from him. I think it's important to mention that actually it was a collaboration. And also he is very well known, Rotimi Fani Kayode, and even he had a short period of, of time to work. He, he has a, a legacy and a big, really big work he was able to produce in these years. 
Okay. Now we go to the next person, which is Abraham Hogobase. He was born in 1979 in Lagos. And he was already through Akimbodi Akimbi, get in touch with photography and was invited to Berlin. This when I met him firstly, which was maybe 2010 or something. So, you know, the first time like he, he, he left, he left Nigeria and he worked, at that time he worked a lot also about identity and also with himself. And here we can, see, we can go through the four pictures. And the work is called Ecstasy, which was made in 2009. And I think, you know, how could, you know, who made this picture? And I thought it funny when he told me that actually he asked a young kid, he gave the camera to a young kid and said, when I jump, take the picture. Because he thought he liked, you know, this childish vision, because he thought like if he asked a kid, a kid would have a good mention of when the jump is. Okay, we go then. Yeah, so you know sometimes then maybe it gets a little bit out of focus, but... Um, and here we can see Abraham with his work uh, and also, you know, presented in a blog. And this is another image also from Abraham Okobase, who meanwhile lives in Toronto, in Canada. And this is, you know, you see, maybe you remember I suppose you do remember this is Adagogo's picture. And Abraham used this picture. That's why we can say he worked with analog in this work. And over this, he put a text in a magazine from the British from 1922 about the hut tax. You know, because the people there, they had all of a sudden, they had to pay taxes for their houses. You know, first they took everything away from them and then they put tax on them. And there had been some revolts against this. And this text is about this. And this is a work out of a series which is called Constructed Realities, which now Abby showed this year in 2022 in a show at Pace Gallery in London, Living with Ghosts. So also Abraham made a wonderful career. He also will be in the MoMA show next year which is curated by a um, Nigerian curator, Oloremo Olabanju. And one thing also I just I think is to mention now, I mean, many of these I've shown you now are really known, but always in these African contexts. And I think the next step would be, like even here, I talk about African photography, but not only in an African context. You know, like what made Akimbodi so famous, that he was in the documenta, amongst all the others artists, so no kind of out of this context. Okay, we go. The next work is by Rahima Gambo. She was born in 1986, and she is from Abuja, but also she is, is the boarding school, secondary school she made in England, and then she studied photojournalism in the US, and then when she came back to Nigeria, she became uh, she came to our program first to the Lagos Photo Summer School and then to Photo Factory and mostly works digital like a multimedia artist meanwhile. But here is a work where she worked with analog photography. That's why I think it fits for the talk. And this work is out of a series called A Walk where she, when she came back to Abuja, she said like to be able to connect with her country. She made a series on walking and she found those images torn apart on the street, took them, and I think very poetically added drawing to this and connected these images again. And I think it's a very interesting, and as I already said, poetic way to work with photography and to open up the medium. And also, uh, meanwhile, Rahima is very well known, mostly work with digital, and she is a guest lecturer, meanwhile, for our program. And Antio, Anthony Mande Asokere, he is born in 1991, so the youngest of the talk, 
And he came to our program already 2013, so I know him for a long time. And he lives in Makoko, a slum in Nigeria, which is next to the water. And many houses are already built into the water. And there, in 2010, I think it was, there was a project by Adolfo's Ofada, which was called the Silent Majority Project, where they came in and gave cameras to young people there who want to work with photography. And for Monday, he get really hooked. And through this, he, he came to be a photographer. And here, maybe, can we st stay a little bit on this picture? I think, you know, Monday, many people now came to Makoko, you know, like foreigners, and they find a fixer who bring them through and they snap out of a car or out of the ship or something. But Monday, because he lives there and all the people know him, he really manages to get really close to the people and um, finds a unique vision towards his environment. And this image, for instance, I really like in a sense that I think he's already invisible. You know, like if I would take pictures there, everybody would defer to me, the white person, and what do I want there, and they would react completely different. But here, you know, it's his surroundings, so nobody actually realizes him anymore. And this, for me, nearly looks like, like something staged, you know, like if it would be in a theater piece, like every person has his own place. And I think it's a very interesting way between documentary and staged photography. And uh, actually, I think he's a very interesting, very promising photographer, and also that he works with analog, because it's all different there, you know, to work with analog, because they don't have labs or, or things like this. And everybody nearly works with digital, but he doesn't. Also, you know, like this, um, also, also this kind of between staged and not, I think, uh, is really interesting. Okay, I don't know, maybe I was too quick. I'm not sure whether this is really 20 minutes now. One thing I also wanted to mention about analog photography, or when I already said like a long time African photography, even it was well, well known and let's say appreciated, it stayed also always in this African context. But now there is a book from Marilyn Nance. He, she is based in America, but originally came from Nigeria and made a book on Festag 77, which was an art festival in Lagos. And this book now was shortlisted at the Aperture Photography Prize in Paris. So, you know, and also another book from an analog photographer, Sabelo Mlangeni, was shortlisted in Paris. So I think it's a good, good next step that sort of African photographers get out of this context. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. So, any questions? Where are the questions? Here. Um, that's fantastic. But, I mean, is Nigeria, is there other similar, like, things happening on that coast and stuff with Ghana and... Are there other ph analog photography sort of, like, things happening along other countries than in Africa? You know, when I prepared this talk, like photographers I know, I wrote, I said, do you have some analog work? Do you have some analog, especially younger photographers? And most of them don't because there are no labs there. You know, not anymore. At the time, like Ochekare, of course he had a lab at that time because there was no digital photography. But as soon as digital photography was invented, hardly any analog photography was done anymore. They don't have chemists and all those things. So most of the people do not work with this, unfortunately. But, for, I mean, South Africa is a, is a very different country, but in South Africa, like Sabelo Mlageni, let's say, who is very well known meanwhile, also always works with analog. But the younger generation hardly does. But like Akimbodi Akimbi, he, when he started photography, there was only analog, so he, kept with this. But I think 
you know, or uh, let's say I know the Lele Institute, this is a photography workshop space. For a long time they tried to put in analog. And remember from the school where I uh, start, uh, teached in Berlin for some time ago, we gave them, you know, we brought them enlargers. You know, like in, in a big suitcase, I brought them in a larger, but these days they're all the time because they do not have the chemists and stuff. But as there is um, in Nigeria, like today, not that much, I have to admit, just because of the difficulties. Yeah. Any other? Yes. At the beginning, you mentioned a book you made. Could you tell us more about it? When we started the photo factory in 2016, we were already thinking like not only make an educational program, but just, you know, to, to promote Nigerian photography and to open up in publications and such. And my interest is always in intercultural collaborations. You know, like I come from Europe and from Austria actually and work there. And so I wanted to do something within this context. And also I'm very interested in art and spirituality. And so I found that there is a woman, Susanne Wenger, actually from Graz, who went to Nigeria in 1950, became a Yoruba priestess, and she was an artist before already, and then with an artistic approach in Oshobo in Nigeria, in the Oshun groove, she made sculptures for the Oshun goddess. You know, so this is already a work, an intercultural work, like she is a Austrian woman coming to Nigeria, working in the arts, together with Yoruba people. And she didn't make the work alone, you know, she worked in collaboration with the Yoruba craftsmen. So this theme was, I was really interested in, like also this aspect of collaboration. And so I invited two Nigerian photographers, Rahima Gambo and Adeola Olagunshu, and a European photographer, Roberta Stein and myself. We went there together to photograph the grooves, actually, let's say, to take some artistic work and out of this work create a new work. And this is our first publication. And we have a website, of course, www.photofactory.lagos.de, so if you're interested, you can find our book there. And, uh, actually, so we, we, we are a publishing house now, which is, uh, which is the next step. Any other question? Trajas, maybe? <laughs> yeah? Architecture or landscape doesn't seem to play an important part in Nigerian photography. Human beings are... <laughs> Architecture or landscape doesn't seem to play an important part in Nigerian photography. Yes. Or yes, maybe. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Like um, my observation, you know, like a European person, Nigerians, you know, they're very, I mean, not all the time, but very much attached to, to people, to, to cities, to, to people, to life, to action and this thing. And I think even the idea of landscape is a European notion. You know, they, they have the land, they, they work, they work with the land. This is also like this idea of spirituality, the Oshun grove, what I talked before. The river goddess Oshun is the river. So they refer to the landscape, you know, like like uh, uh, they don't have this kind of notion, and I think this is a very European concept. I mean, architecture, like they, I mean, for instance, one of the photo factory uh, photographers, Aisha Adeyemi, she photographed all the, the colonial buildings and stuff, but in digital, you know. So it's not that it's not the same, but for me, like, I really try to refer to analog. But in a way, it's an interesting question because 
Um, I think this is quite a European concept. Yes, thank you, yes. Come here, help me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Eva, thank you for coming. Uh, it, it, it just to, to ask some question and to add uh, something. Um, because Eva was in Ethiopia in 2010. So uh, how was your, like, it's just in general, because you're talking about Nigeria, and also nice to talk about in general photography in analog, because a part of what I really love, like, part of this festival is it's analog and also it's hard with the with the with the like with the chemical with the camera like uh, in our place so what like do you how was like your experience also in Ethiopia that was the initial thing that to go in Nigeria so it would be nice if you talk about So I uh, like no. It would be yeah. nice if you share like a little bit about in 2010. How was like in Ethiopia with the analog photography in the photography? If you talk about a little yes. bit, you yes. know, because it's yeah. really nice to have. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, there has actually, I met in 2010 when this was the first time when I made a project on the African continent and it was a very different experience than, than Nigeria. I mean, Ethiopia is a totally different country and um, there I remember uh, Michael Tsegaye, like an, an Ethiopian photographer who worked mainly with analog photography and also I think we brought analog cameras um, but, you know, like as I work in Nigeria, of course I have much more insight in, 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 Niger in Nigerian photography, but I had the notion, then in Ethiopia there was the artist photo festival, and there we saw a lot of analog photography. So actually there I think was more analog photography than, than in Nigeria. And you know, as I'm teaching also in Nigeria, we, I talk on... Um, history of African photography and contemporary African photography. So I'm aware that like in other countries, there, there's, uh, there's a lot of analog photography, but here I just want you to focus uh, on Nigeria. Or as I said, in South Africa, for instance, there is a lot, but this is a very different thing. But I think Ethiopia yeah, also has a very big photography scene, actually. No, there's a big, big photography, but I think actually there has, I think you know more about it. <laughs> you know more about it. Okay, do we have some more questions or is our time, is it over? Do you know you will know? Yeah, yes. We're going to continue automatically yes. with the second guest, but if yes. you have another question, yes. still a few minutes time. Okay, no, then thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you for coming for us, especially for the talk. Our next guest is also arrived. Uh, he arrived not just for the talk, he had also, uh, he curated the exhibition. Uh, you can, you can uh, visit at the Kulturzentrum Korotan uh, from, uh, with uh, artists from uh, Ukraine and uh, with artists from the MUP. School of Photography, and about this project, he's telling us now something, and I'm gonna let the presentation on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Sergei Menichenko. Uh, I'm from Ukraine. Uh, we're very happy to be here and be presented uh, at this festival. We met Dina in Budapest at the art fair market, and he invited us to present our my photography school, my students. So now our exhibition is held in Korotan Hotel. So please, when you have free time, go there and have a look on this exhibition. And um, 
Yesterday, I had the first part of my speech. Uh, I told uh, some words about myself, uh, my biography, my art, and you can just now like make this fast slideshow. Yeah, I told about how I did my first camera, about the first projects, first attempts into photography, into like film photography, black and white photography, how did I went into the conceptual and art photography, how I started to exhibit my works, uh, to spread it, like to be published and everything. Yeah, so uh, I've told about this uh, some projects more like detailed, but some more uh, in a short way because I'm in photography since 2009, already like 13 years and it's going to be like a lot of time to show all the projects and to show everything which I did for these 13 years. Yeah, also it was a funny moment from my life when I was working in China and did some uh, funny jobs there and the same way I was doing photography as well there and I did uh, my one of the main projects of my life, which is called Behind the Scenes. Yeah, you will see it soon. Yeah, so uh, I really like mixing different styles of photography, love to invent something new for myself, to explore new visual languages and everything. Yeah, so, uh, and about Behind the Scenes, uh, we're going a bit to the topic of my today's speech, it's myth. Actually, it's Mykolaiv Young photography. Mykolaiv, it's the city in Ukraine where I'm from, in the south of Ukraine, and uh, actually where I did found my photography school in 2018. And because, uh, why I did it? Because actually in 2017, I got one of the main uh, awards for photographers, uh, it's a Leica Oscar Barnack Award, and from the time I've decided like that I really have uh, now a chance, I have some experience for like eight years, at that time it was already eight years for me in photography, I did like a lot of books and everything, so my wish was uh, to find some young newcomer emerging artists in my hometown and to try to work with them, uh, yeah, you can go, uh, to try to work with them and to help them in developing themselves with photography, to teach them about like what is photography in its own, what is conceptual photography, what is art photography. Uh, so that's how in 2018 I made my first artist talk in my hometown and this is, it was some of them and this is how yeah, we can stop here. Uh, Mykolaiv Young Photography uh, School appeared. By that time, uh, it was actually like a local thing. It was a local story where I just uh, had like 20 people. And uh, I saw that in my hometown, it's a small city for Ukraine, that we have really some amount of good photographers who can work in that field of conceptual and art photography. And so uh, it was like a fast course, like 12 lessons, month and half or something. Uh, we did a good final project, we did an exhibition, and uh, then I, like, I was a bit sad that the story is finished. So I decided that uh, I want to continue to work with these young talents. And uh, so I decided to create the kind of MIF community, MIF collective, which means that, you can slide next one, please. Uh, it's the next year where like was growing. Uh, it was, it meant that uh, we don't do just like, uh, you can stop here. Yeah. We don't just do like the uh, teaching lessons or like courses, but after I'm trying to help them with promoting themselves with exhibitions, festivals, fairs, like publishings to find collectors, we, uh, to take part in the festivals and everything. So it was my aim like uh, to gather these people with a common uh, view, you know, and who want to develop themselves in photography. So from that time we started to grow and uh, this is our like sum of exhibitions in 2018, 20. If in two years we just like made, uh, and by the way, if you can see this one, uh, second one, MIF, uh, 
вогнем та мечем українське мистецтво. This one I will show. This one is here in Semer Depot. <laughs> it was a big project of Ukrainian art here in 2018, and uh, I was invited to show my uh, fundamental space explorations project, and I also dealed to take few of my students as well in this project, like to, to help them, like to show the art in Vienna. So you can slide next. Uh, so in few years, like 2019-20, we really did like 15 exhibitions in Europe, in Ukraine, in Poland, in Austria, in Paris, and um, we really started to grow. But uh, when COVID started, pan when pandemia started, uh, we went into online because everything was closed, but I really couldn't just stop everything. So I decided that I can go, but online to try to find people who want to con con connect to me online. And uh, I was really surprised because it was a lot of people from all over the Ukraine and even like Ukrainians who lived abroad for some time because they really wanted to join us, but they didn't find a way like to come and to live in Mykolaiv, to study and everything. So we had uh, a success in that. Yeah, you can go next. And in 2020, we did a big online show because our exhibitions, because of the COVID, was all the time postponed, postponed. So we decided to make an online exhibition and we did it like by ourselves, like only few of my students. One is like web designer, one is IT uh, worker, and me who was uh, in charge of all the installations, this kind of framing. Uh, so we did a, a huge exhibition online, you can put next. Uh, it was 25 project in that, 25 students. And uh, when we saw the statistics of the online exhibition, we see that uh, we were shown like 2,000 times 2000 views from all over the world from USA from Europe from Ukraine so it was really nice yeah we can go and in 2021 we had the artist talk of Roger Balin as well because I had some kind of exhibition with him and asked to support our school and asked if he can make something for our school he said of course and we had an artist talk of Roger Balin as well okay yeah, but 24th February changed everything. The war started in our country, but we didn't stop. We can go further. Uh, and I usually uh, use this slogan, art is keeping us alive in this war, uh, because we really do a lot with the help of the art to support our people in their needs. Yeah, we can go. And yesterday I showed this project, Military Commissariat. You saw it fast. And yesterday I asked people like to focus on it because um, that's how art really helped us. Uh, in the beginning of the war, I uh, found a way to sell this series of works uh, via NFT uh, for, it was the first days, uh, for uh, $8,000 because uh, it was a huge support from NFT community uh, to Ukrainian artists and I just put it online and wrote that all the uh, money from sales will go to the nation to help people like who is like resettling, refuging and everything. So we sell it like in an hour, 14 pieces for $8,000 and uh, all the money in few weeks were sent to different people, like uh, all the money. And the same, uh, we can go next, and the same we did with MIF. We did uh, a, also a huge collection of photography of my students and also sold, uh, but uh, I wanted with this, uh, uh, with this uh, collection, I wanted at uh, the first time to support my students as well, because m most of them are young artists uh, who like studies or have some kind of jobs and they didn't have uh, like a job at the time and everything. So I told them that uh, we can charge like 50% on donations from the sales, but if you or your family or somebody has any problems with money, you can put like all the money from the sales to yourself because uh, my aim was to help my students as well, like because they're also like the people in, of Ukraine and uh, they need support. Yeah.
Uh, in April, I had a call from the uh, publishing house, which made my book a few years ago from Ukraine, and they suggested uh, to make a book of my photography school. Uh, we decided to split it 50-50, like 50% uh, like from the publishing house, 50% from me, <laughs> and we decided to make uh, this kind of book because it's. We think it's important now, like to share with the world uh, Ukrainian art. But it was not focused on the war or something. But you can find a lot of new senses there, even with the oldest projects. But some of them uh, are new, like after 24th of February in the book. So we started to work on the book. The publishing house is called Rodovit Press from uh, Ukraine, from Kiev, and uh, the designer is Katya Katerina Lesiv. She's very cool. She has, uh, she was shortlisted for the Perch uh, Prize on Paris Photo with her book as well. And we started to work on the book and since April till se September we did a huge work on the book. We selected 63 authors from our school. Now we have like more than 100 active authors, but for book we selected like uh, 63. I think we can, we can go next. Yeah, it's some slides of the book. You can show them. Yeah. Uh, and all the, like we decided to make 500 copies on Ukrainian language and 500 copies on English language. So in final we have like 1,000 copies which we spread around the world showing on uh, festivals, fairs, exhibitions, presentations like here as well and um, the, the how we like supporting our young artists to be on the view uh, and the first um, I wanted also something to tell Ah, and all the dialogues here on the book uh, inside. Yeah, here is only some uh, some pages, but somewhere you can find it to have a look and to buy here. Uh, all the dialogues for these books were, were made uh, specially for this book, so all the texts are not like in a catalog that we just took from the like artist bio or something and put inside. So uh, yeah, here is Artem Humilevsky work who um, we can go back a bit. Um, yeah, Artem Humilevsky, he's here. He's uh, from my uh, hometown, Mykolaiv, as well. And a few days ago, he was nominated, uh, he was awarded, not nominated, he was awarded for the Global Peace Prize here in Vienna, in Austria, in the Parliament of Vienna. And as well, his works are now presented in Korotan Hotel. So, and all the dialogues were made specially for this book. So, we did a big job with that. Yeah, we can go further. Uh, so we prepared this book uh, and our goal was to present it at first at Unseen Photography Fair in uh, Amsterdam, uh, what we did in September. Yeah. Uh, so we was in Russian the last days, as always, you know, like with these publishing things and sh schedules and everything, but we did it on time, so we presented it on the Unseen Amsterdam Photography Fair. Then we uh, we can go next. Then we had uh, an exhibition on the Tbilisi Art Fair in Georgia. Also presented this book. Uh, then we went to Budapest Art Fair where we uh, met with Dina and was invited to this great festival to take part. Here's we like presenting the book with our team. <laughs> yeah, this is also from that. So we tried to do as much as we can. Here is Norway. Uh, we. It's our like the full trip uh, to here from uh, Ukraine to Norway, from Norway to Italy, from Italy to Bratislava, from Bratislava to Vienna. So it was uh, done in Norway. Yeah, and uh, also we opened uh, an exhibition of MIF few days ago in USA, in, uh, uh, the, uh, this is in Hamburg. We were invited to make like one evening print sale for charity and it was like six girls uh, from MIF authors who was also selling their prints and uh, selling their books and uh, part of the money we donated to the fund of our friend also from Mikolaev to the foundation. Yeah, and we've just opened a, a big exhibition of MIF in USA in uh, University of Design and Art in Kerne. But now we will stop a bit because uh, this is the story which is the best one, I think. Uh, because before we went to Norway, uh, it was a... Um, 
in Kiev, in Ukraine. Uh, we wanted to open the, we had a plan, we already was prepared to open the big MIF exhibition in Kiev, in a good gallery in the center of Kiev. Um, uh, but uh, we wanted to open it on 13th of October, but on 10th the center of Kyiv was bombed, so we decided to postpone it for a week to open it on uh, tw 20th. Actually nothing changed a lot, but we decided that we need to do it anyway. And uh, when everything was prepared for the opening, one hour before I had a call from a gallery that the light is off everywhere, like in the area and the districts. Like now you can see in the news in Ukraine, everything like uh, that was only the first steps. Uh, but uh, we decided to text it in our social media that if you want to come, you can come. So it's up to you what we're going to do. And we were really shocked because we had like more than 100 people in the opening with the lights, with the telephones, with the lights, with the uh, fancy lights from home and everything. And it was uh, with the lamps, like photographic lamps, colored ones, like red ones, blue ones and everything. And the atmosphere was super magical that evening. Like everything everybody was really happy everybody was uh, looking the photos everybody was talking everybody was having fun it was such a great like uh, I don't know like um, the co communication and everything so you can put like few yeah it was like this and after that uh, really like you can go yeah all the biggest medias in Ukraine started to write about that exhibition like from the next day, yeah, it was like this fancy, fancy light and everything. And uh, yeah, this is how it looks with a normal uh, gallery light. Yeah, and after that we had like, uh, we were published like around 15 times in all the biggest media, like The Village is a huge one in Ukraine, like the next one like is BBC Ukraine, uh, Vogue Ukraine, and, and uh, we have a lot of like interviews and everything, so that is how like we're doing against everything is happening in Ukraine, you know, like our, we really love how our uh, nation people are communicating about that and splitting, you know, like uh, together to to show our, like, powerful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Congratulations. You. Appreciate your work and once I have to take a hoodie of map, oh, you know, I'm going to be also... <laughs> only one? <laughs> okay, then I'm going to take this one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, some questions for Sergey? No questions. I, I told everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe visit, visit the exhibition once again. Uh, Kultur Centrum Korotan in the 8th district, where he displays. And from my side, a big congratulation. You did a job. Thank Really? And it was so nice to meet you and to get in uh, this short time, um, actually, yeah. <laughs> We're really happy to be here. We're really happy to be here and present uh, MIF here and to show the world, like, it's Ukrainian art and emerging art is so cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, no questions? We are coming to our last guest for tonight for talk so um, as a one man show you excuse that i have to do the setup here too so mr micha kolna <laughs> welcome to the stage <laughs> so nice to see you in this in this um, talk tonight uh, thank you, thank you. Um, basically, I'm not uh, presenting anything apart from a couple of uh, selected photos that I found. Um, so I'm kind of like a little bit of an outsider in this festival for simple reason, because uh, 
As I'm interested in visual culture, visual art, or image making, I don't necessarily understand how certain images are made. Um, and then, basically, sometimes I don't see the difference between analog and, and digital photography, unless it's very obvious. And basically seeing this exhibition inside, it's very interesting because I saw a couple of works that are quite obvious that wouldn't work otherwise than in like an analog photography. For instance, I saw uh, uh, Jana or Jana Dilo. It's an amazing work. And, uh, and um, I, I don't know how it's made, I, I didn't completely understand, but it's obvious that uh, basically the process in this case is very important. And uh, basically for, for the creators, for the artists and photographers, the process is very important always. It's not only the result, it's also how the particular artist came to the result. <clears throat> so, basically, in, in 20 years ago, approximately 20 years ago, the digital photography completely prevailed in the, in the market. So, the photographers who didn't adopt, um, they were gone. Uh, I mean, in professional sense. So, somebody who would work for a magazine, somebody who would do the advertising photography, had to switch. There was no way to continue working with, uh, with um, analog photography, with film. Um, so, but what happened was that in basically art photography, um, analog technique remained. So it, it didn't go anywhere. And it's now the scene is getting bigger and bigger. And it's also interesting to see that in less than 10 years, the, at least in the place where I'm coming from, that's uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia, like the entire infrastructure, all the dark rooms, uh, entire infrastructure of, for analog photography was basically dismantled. And now uh, it exists again, um, but it functions as, a, as some kind of a underground scene. So in, in Ljubljana, for instance, we have a collective, a group of photographers uh, who call themselves uh, Kela, and they just rented a basement and they have a lot of equipment and a lot of material there and they're just working and if somebody needs anything, then you, you contact them and go there. So basically, uh, in a way, analog photography moved to the underground, but it's very present in the, in, in the arts, in the so-called photography as art or art photography. Um, and all that has a lot to do with the need for the material touch, for the materiality of, uh, of a photograph. And materiality is not necessarily related to the analog process. Nowadays, a lot of younger generation artists, they do very material installations made with some kind of photographic process, but it could be also digital. It's just material, it's just in the space. And a lot of it we can also see here. Um, so basically the, the, the period when the analog photography seemingly went away, went into oblivion, but very, very short. Um, so it was interesting that already in 2006 and 2007, um, one of the theorists of, on hi historians of photography, Charlotte Cotton, um, added um, a chapter in her um, very let's say, important uh, book about uh, contemporary photography, uh, The Photograph as Contemporary Art. She added uh, a chapter called Physical and Material, where she tried to emphasize the reasons why the image makers and also filmmakers are so defiant in following uh, the trend of digitalization. So not everybody bought that story. So it, it's, it's almost similar to 
If you remember when 30 years ago the uh, long place in the music industry seemingly disappeared, people say, okay, it's gone, you know, now we'll have only CDs and then further on MP3s, you know, just digital files, but the LPs are coming back big time. And so the, the fact is that um, things are usually not disappearing. They just change, the, their status is changed, but they wouldn't disappear. And the same is with the analog photography. So what, what we see here is uh, it's an image by uh, a Slovenian photographer. His name is Andrei Lamut. He is uh, also very defiant to, to, to actually use uh, analog photography. Um, simply because of its effect, of the aesthetic, because of its aesthetics. I guess, as far as I know, as far as he told me, uh, he cannot get the same effect with a digital image as he can with, the, with an analog. So, yeah, for instance, this is one of his um, pieces. This is the series called Nemosis from 2018. Uh, again, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely aware how he does that, but uh, the fact is that the, the process, again, is so, so significant. And I assume that maybe something similar can be done digitally, but on the other hand, it would definitely look different, I would say. So basically, in the now following minutes, I'll show you a lot of photos were with of different artists and photographers who are using actually analog techniques with a purpose so what 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 i'm interested in is why why is why is the technique so important with um with certain photographers so one more so this is uh, an image of um Bin Dan, um, a Vietnamese photographer. I think he lives in, 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 in Europe for a longer period of time now. And uh, this is the, the work uh, made with the chlorophyll print. I hope it's visible. I'm a little bit on the side. But what he depicted, because he's from Vietnam, he was using the leaves and he was using the chlorophyll print for, to, to print on the leaf. So basically, in his case, this very, very, it's, it's very conceptual why he is using this specific process, a very difficult process, again, that don't, I don't understand completely, and probably um, nobody, uh, nobody can. So the series is called uh, Immortality, the Remnants of the Vietnam and American War from 2007 and 2008. One more. So yeah, here we see the, the images of the al al aircrafts that were basically bombing <laughs> Vietnam during the 60s and, uh, and the 70s. So this image is... Uh, made by Sally Mann, probably one of the most popular photographers who started using a wet collodion process. Um, and this is from the 2000. Uh, it's called the anti -Atom 11 battlefields. So basically her point was that she wanted to use the same technique as the photographers at the time of the American Civil War to get these aesthetics. Again, there is a very conceptual um, reason why to use that. And one more. So yeah, this is the piece called Valentine Winslow, Deep South, Landscape of Louisiana and Mississippi from 1998. Again, she wants to kind of recreate this period of time with the same tools as the photographers of the 1860s and 1870s. And one small, one more. And yeah, the, the series What Remains. Um, 
again, it could be, it, it could, it's, it's very ambivalent. She was actually um, left, she was collaborating with the police on the f field where they were leaving the bodies to decompose in order to examine them for, for scientific purposes, basically. But again, you know, she's using the, the, the old technique and again, you know, this can be, can resemble, you know, the, the photographs from the Civil War in the 1860s, even though the series itself is not uh, about uh, history. Um, one more. So here we have, uh, again, uh, wet collodion uh, <clears throat> process, uh, Kasia Wozniak. Now, the, again, she wants to recreate some kind of very, very nostalgic aesthetics. You know, she's, her work is all about the belonging, passing time, nostalgia, and so on. One more. Um, so she's doing the portraits, and in, even though these portraits are basically very uh, portraits of very contemporary people, um, you know, of modern period, they still have this feeling of the past. You know, they look like the portraits from that time. So basically, you know, the technique, as we will see even with the next uh, further images, will uh, actually can define a certain period of time. One more. Uh, this, is, this is another one of Kasia, Kasia Wozniak uh, portraits. And one more, please. So basically uh, talking about wet collodion, which is a very popular technique. Again, I don't exactly know why, but I'm, I know uh, empirically that lots of um, photographers actually turned to this process. These are Mark and Scully Osterman, Abbey Chimneys from around 2010. Um, in, in, at some point there is, um, the, the reason could be also the mere fascination with the medium and it's completely fine, doesn't matter. And um, uh, Mark and Scully Osterman are considered as um, let's say masters of the, of the wet collodion and probably also other old techniques. One more. And this is Borut Petrlin. I think he, he, he was here, or he's still somewhere here at the festival. He also started using wet collodion around almost 10 years ago. And this is his series, The Great Depression, from 2013, where he again wanted to use this wet collodion plate in order to recreate this period of time, not, not the Great Depression itself, because the Great Depression was only one of the recessions, economic recessions in the history of, let's say, um, in the history of uh, capitalism. So we are constantly going in circles. So he decided to use the technique from the 19th century because the recessions and conjunctions are happening every 10 to 15 years since the basically beginning of the 19th century. One more. <clears throat> and then when I was talking about specific aesthetic, you know, maybe n n none other type of photograph has a, this kind of specific aesthetic as, as a Polaroid. Polaroid, which was probably the biggest in the 80s, also in the, in the 70s, but mostly in the 80s. And by the time when Ryan McGinley did this photo from his series, Kids Are All Right, in uh, 2002, um, Polaroid was already forgotten. But what Polaroid did was some kind of, uh, you know, people associated with this instant photography, you know, like the snapshot uh, photography, you know, is, um, is done with the, with, the, with the Polaroids, you know, or, you know, the photo that is basically made as soon as it's uh, taken. Uh, one more. So there are more like artists still now, even though Polaroid itself doesn't exist anymore. I think it, we, we talked about that yesterday. It changed its name. Um, the Polaroid factory is not doing, but other producers are still 
producing similar um, things as Polaroid. So this is uh, Anna Fabricius, no, Hannah Haley, untitled, sorry, 2013, and one more. Again, Hannah Haley, uh, basically <coughs> snapshot, like the, the snapshot aesthetics, you know, with these very, very specific colors. And these photos always look like 70s or 80s, even though they're maybe done now. So one more. So this is um, Anna Fabricius. Um, and one more, please. Again. So again, very, very um, significant thing uh, and very characteristic thing with the Polaroid. I've seen many, many series of photographs where Polaroid, because of their shape, they, they have this space underneath where uh, photographers would write on it, you know, comments or captions or whatever. It's important, you know, um, it's calling for it. So one more. And yeah, again, Polaroid from 2008, Natasha Koschmerl from Slovenia. So it's just, I mean, it's, it's endless, you know, like many, many artists would use uh, Polaroids in their, in their work. And please go for, further. Um, and then Camera Obscura, the most basic, you know, um, technique in, in, or the, the oldest uh, technique in, 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 the, in photography. Uh, this is uh, Vera Luther, Frankfurt Airport from 2001. Uh, basically a photograph that was done with, uh, I think the exposition was one day. So, but again, you know, she was kind of like a defiant, you know, in the period where everything turned away from, from analog photography. She went back to the roots, you know, to use uh, camera obscura. One more. Uh -huh. Again, uh, Vera Luther, Maria Lach from 2010. Um, again, very long, long exposition. And one more. Uh, this is uh, an image of uh, Bojan Salai from Ljubljana, Slovenia, and his series Interiors, which are actually Exteriors from 2008. And again, there is, there is like a very, very conceptual reason why using Camera Obscura, and that's uh, aesthetically, it gives this very, very soft image, and also it was printed on canvas. Uh, what he was questioning in this piece was the, the very history of Slovenian art, national art, what is considered like national art, and that was Impressionism. So he went to these places that are very, very significant, but like this waterfall that almost had like a mythical uh, significance, mythical meaning in, in the national history of art. And... Uh, he took pictures with, with, uh, with camera obscura, very basic, self-made camera obscura. One more. Uh, yeah, this is another, another image. This is a site of, uh, uh, of a massacre that happened in, after the World War II, but still it went, it became part of the um, national mythology, national dispute. One more. <clears throat> And for instance, another interesting way, you know, how to use uh, Camera Obscura. This is uh, Uros Abram, also from Slovenia, and, and this piece is called Made in Me, because he made this definitely very portable Camera Obscura, where he made pictures with his mouth. So basically his mouth was the medium. When he opened the mouth, he took picture. Again, I don't know exactly technically how he did it, but it wasn't easy, as far as I know. So, further. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is uh, Susan Derges' photogram. Again, the most basic way of how to use a photograph, older than the pho photography itself. One more. Uh, yeah, Riverto, another piece by Susan Derges, with kind of like using very, very basic tools, you know, analog tools. Um, and one more. 
uh, Marketa Otova, something I can't remember from um, uh, the 2000s. Again, you know, sh she was trying to recreate the, 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 the feeling of the 1930s. That was the purpose. And to do that, she would use a very like basic black and white camera, probably the gelatin silver print that actually could recreate this aesthetics, you know, of the, of the 1930s. Ah. <laughs> Um, okay, one more. Again, here we have um, Polaroid by Sahin Kaigun, a Turkish photographer. This is from 1980s. And one more, please. Um, he was basically using all kinds of um, techniques to actually gain special aesthetics for, for his images. Um, again, sometimes the, the, the technical aspect itself is not well known or at least um, um, I wouldn't, me personally wouldn't understand it. Sometimes it's not even important, I guess, but you know that certain, again, this kind of photographs cannot be um, recreated like in a, in a digital way. One more. So this is Australian photographer and artist Tracy Moffat, Laudanum from 1998. Again, um, Tracy Moffat uses archival processes of photogravure, um, and because she's actually talking about the 19th century, about the colonialism, about uh, history, bloody history of Australia, about racism, and again, you know, she fought like this aesthetic, you know, of analog photography, of this kind of photogravure, is the best way to do it. Um, yeah, further. Um, then one of the, I would say, alchemists of, of uh, analog photography was also uh, Gabor Kerekes, a uh, Hungarian photographer um, who used different techniques and basically um, he never properly told anybody what he did because the, the one more please the process was very very combined hybrid um, this is the series called over Roosevelt one more please yeah again so what looks like a simple aer aerial photograph is not that it's it's something more there's something more in the process of making it that makes this photograph what it is further and of course uh, the photographer Miroslav Tichy who became actually very notorious just before he died um, there were basically uh, exhibitions made with his work um, he was a documentary was made about him he was basically we could call him like a, um, a weirdo who lived in a small town in Czech Republic and he took photos especially of women he was almost a stalker but what was interesting that he was actually making his own cameras he was so hardcore and so underground in that he didn't really care about anything and basically the exhibition that was organized in I think Kunsthalle Zürich he didn't even have a desire to go there you know he was just um, he didn't care one more but in, in, a, in an interesting way you know he became a chronicler of this town and, and his photographs um, are really really um, they look like a camera obscura, one more, uh, but nobody exactly knows what it is. But this is one of his cameras, his self-made uh, cameras. And uh, um, for him, I guess there was no conceptual purpose. The purpose of him, uh, his purpose was to make photography cheap and affordable for him. Um, and now to, to finish with, I have a couple of examples of um, 
uh, a process called uh, found photography, which is very interesting. I really, it's, it's a very archival process, you know, the, when the basically artists or photographers and sometimes not even taking photographs, but they become collectors or editors or archivists of uh, the images that they would find. And uh, definitely one of my favorite um, photographers or artists who is a collector of photographs is uh, Hans-Peter Feldman. And this is his photo book from 2013. And one more. So he was, or he is obsessed with organizing photographs, you know, by the team. You know, he would collect photographs of cats, he would collect photographs of sunsets, of some very banal um, motives, and, and actually put them together. So, like, one of his very famous pieces was uh, photographs uh, of 9-11, when he bought like all the newspapers on 12th of September uh, 2001 because 9-11 was such a global event that it was on every cover of the newspaper so he actually ex exhibited newspapers as ready-mades um, go on and the other very interesting artist is uh, Joachim Schmidt again a per, uh, an artist who would collect photographs um, all of them, they're, they're, they're still, I don't know, I guess they're artists now who are interested in collecting digital photographs, but it's, I guess it's easier to, to collect analog or it's more exciting. In, in this case, you know, to collect digital photographs, you would have to steal or find a hard disk of somebody. Um, with analog photographs, um, for instance, Joachim Schmidt is, would actually find them in a physical space, go on. Um, he would find uh, uh, undeveloped films and would develop them. Films that would, he would find them in the garbage, he would find them on uh, flea markets and so on and so on. So this is a series called Other People's Photographs from 2008. Um, one more. And uh, X marks the spots. 2013, like also found photographs from um, from different sources. We we don't necessarily know um, where he would find them. And one more. And of course, uh, Susan May Salas and Nadir Nadiro, family narrative from 1996. She would use a family archive to actually tell a story of the. Kurds of basically Kurdish people, so the the entire project uh, was called uh, Kurdistan in the Shadow of History, and she was working on it for a really long time, from 1991 to 2008, more than 15 years. So again, you know, these are not her photographs, even though she combined this archive photographs with her own. Uh, but basically, she was an interesting to take her own photos to basically uh, explore history, but she took something that was already in the archive. And one more. And of course, uh, Vali Drat and the Atlas Group. Again, a piece that's more or less entirely based on archives. Family archives, again, found photographs where Vali Drat uh, is telling a fictional story about the War, war in um, Be Beirut, war in uh, Lebanon, that was taking place in the late 70s and throughout the 80s. Um, I mean, the, his stories are fictional, but could be completely true, um, in a way. So that's another one, yeah, of Valid Rad, um, um, uh, an aerial attack. And another one. So the, the, actually the, the photographs are showing the real events, but um, uh, what he's saying about them is not exactly true. And that's how he's kind of like questioning the constructing historical narratives because the truth is a very, very relative category. And the last couple of photos 
Um, this is again um, a project called Untitled Images and it's by Ivan Petrovic from Belgrade, Serbia. And again, he was obsessed with finding um, undeveloped negatives, films. And actually, as he, he told me, he found all these things basically on the street. I don't know why people lose or throw away the films. I, I don't have a clue, but he was obsessed with it. So he found a couple of them, so go on. Um, and uh, what we see, it's the, the interesting thing in found photographs is that we don't have a clue what we're looking at, in what context they were made. We see certain images, but we don't know what, what they are all about. One more. For instance, I, we don't have a clue who this cowboy and the other people are, but that, that this, it's, it's obviously some kind of like a family photograph. And then the question is, why would people throw such personal, intimate photographs away. One more. Again, very interesting. We don't have a clue what it is, but it's curious. And one more. Yeah, uh, I guess a, a tourist photograph. So basically, um, most of the things that I've, I've shown here is uh, the, 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 the technique is extremely important part. So sometimes artists like to say that, that there's no difference between the form and the content, that the content is already part of the form. And I guess in analog photography, it's some, sometimes it is about that. And, and I'm personally, I'm not a, I've never done um, an analog photograph. I've, I've been to darkroom only once in my life, out of curiosity, but uh, what I suspect, and probably you can confirm or not, is that there is something about the process, you know, that basically in this uh, economy of time, you know, when anybody can, can do a photograph, digital photograph, in a second, that taking a longer way, more difficult, more expensive way, it's almost a subversive act, but there must be some joy in, in doing it. So that's it, thank you. And yeah, if you have some comments or, or questions, I'll be happy trying to answer. Thank you very much for this great, great, great presentation. Any questions on it? No questions? Everything clear? <laughs> okay, then uh, thank you very much for visiting us also today. Uh, I would love also to invite you for our last uh, opening tonight, Get Well Soon, in the Wien Station from uh, an artist collective uh, from Belgrade, it's starting at 8 p.m. at the Wien Station. Thanks a lot and enjoy the evening and see you tomorrow for the next talks.